All right, you crazy kids, here's your lecture on the history of the atom. So today we're going to go through five different atoms from our first atomic theory by John Dalton to our current atomic theory, which is really quantum theory. Um, all these scientists come up with changes that, you know, modify the atom over time. I think it's important that you guys see those changes and understand how the atom has evolved. You don't have to memorize all the specifics for each individual scientist. What I'd like you to know is the scientist's name, what their atom looked like, and how they changed the atom to our current understanding of the atom. So our first guy is John Dalton, the first atomic theory. Um, he had four points to it. Like I said, you don't have to memorize these points, but it's a good to understand what we know about the atom and how it's changed over time. He said that all elements are composed of tiny little indivisible particles called atoms. It's cool. We can split the atoms, so that's not quite right, but that's fine. Uh, atoms of the same element are identical in size, mass, and properties. Size and properties is very true. Well, properties can change a little bit, actually. But mass, the mass of individual atoms of the same element can change. Those are called isotopes. We're going to have a lecture on that. And it says atoms of one element are different from the atoms of any other element. That's correct. Different elements have different numbers of protons. Atoms of different elements can mix physically or chemically combine in simple whole number ratios to form compounds. That sounds great. And then chemical reactions occur when atoms are separated from each other, joined or rearranged in a different combination. Sounds great. Atoms of one element, however, are never changed in the atoms of another element as a result of a chemical reaction. That's true. However, it is possible to change one atom into a different atom. Um, that would be a nuclear change. And then John Dalton's atom was very simple. It was a sphere. It looked kind of like this. There was nothing fancy about it. It was just a little tiny speck that he thought everything was made up of. Uh, next scientist changed that idea, and he said that the atom is a little bit more complex than that. He experimented with these things called cathode ray tubes and found a particle that had a charge, a negative charge specifically. He called that particle the electron. So Thompson, what I'd like you to know, J.J. Thompson, he discovered the electron, and then his atom changed John Dalton's atom from that pretty bland atom to this atom. The plum pudding model of the atom is kind of like raisin oatmeal in which you have some positive goo, the oatmeal, and then you have these electrons that are stuck in that positive goo. And that's what the plum pudding model of the atom looks like. So he said that there's positives and negatives. He discovered the actual negative particle called the electron. He kind of made it more advanced. Our next scientist, Ernest Rutherford, he shot alpha particles, and alpha particle is... Well, it kind of looks like this. Oh, boy. Hold on here. Here we go. An alpha particle has two positives and two neutral things, two neutrons and two protons. That's an alpha particle. And a thin sheet of gold foil. And it was able to detect something small, dense, and positively charged at the center of the atom. He called that the nucleus. So Rutherford, this Kiwi who is from New Zealand, uh, discovered the nucleus. He changed that plum pudding model of the atom to an atom that now looked like this. It had a tiny little positive center in the middle and a whole bunch of empty space. He said the nucleus is very small compared to the size of the atom. What I want you to think about is a marble in a football field. So even bigger than that, really. It's more like a marble at the 50-yard 50 line, 50 yard line of Gillette Stadium. And Gillette Stadium would be the whole atom, this whole thing. And that tiny little center of the atom is the marble. So there's a lot of empty space of the atom. He said that the nucleus contains almost all the mass of the atom, and that's correct. In the nucleus, you have protons and neutrons. We know that now. He did not know that, and that's where most of the matter comes from. Not matter, but most of the uh, mass of the atom is located. And then it said the atom is mostly empty space. If you took all the atoms that make up all the humans on Earth and removed the empty space, i.e. all of this, right? This is all the empty space of the atom. There's nothing there, really. Everyone would fit into a small apple. So... Most of everything is nothing. Kind of crazy. All right, our next scientist is Niles Bohr, Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom. I'll let you know what it looks like before I go through these conclusions. Maybe we'll draw it right here. So Bohr agreed about the nucleus, the center of the atom. And then he said that empty space is filled up with these energy levels. And the electrons can exist on those energy levels. So it kind of looks like a bullseye. All right, so this is Bohr's model for the atoms. Well, I lost my last line. We'll go like that. So these are energy levels for our conversation. Let's call them E1, E2, E3, and E4. So that's Bohr's model of the atom. All right. So he said the electrons can reside only at these energy levels. 
Rutherford said the electron is somewhere around here, but we don't know where, okay? So his model of the atom really just looks like that. There's nothing much to it. Bohr said, no, 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 it's more like a bullseye where these energy levels are where electrons can reside. And he came up with this idea when he looked at bright line spectrums. Here are some bright line spectrums in this picture. We'll talk about what those are. So he said, as long as the electron stays in one level, no energy is given off. So an electron might reside at E1, we'll call that the ground state. All right, ground state. The electron can reside there, no big deal. However, I can excite that atom with either heat or electricity, and that electron will absorb energy and jump to a higher level. All right, so let's have this electron jump from E1, well, I don't know, maybe all the way up to E3. And it did that by absorbing energy. However, it's now unstable. That's like you, you know, drinking 50 Red Bulls. So you're freaking out, right? The energy is too much for that electron. It doesn't know what to do. The electron will then jump back down to a lower level and give off a photon of energy equal to the energy difference between the initial and final energy levels. So that electron jumped up to E3. It's unstable. It's going to fall back down. And in the process of falling back down, it's going to give off a photon. And that is what these bright line spectrums are all about. All right, these photons make up the bright line spectrums that we see. So what I'm going to show you is a little experiment at some point in time of how to actually see these bright line spectrums for the atoms that we can look at. You can electrocute some hydrogen and look at through that with a spectroscope, and you will see these individual lines pop up. Those lines are the bright line spectrums of hydrogen. They're made up from the electrons in hydrogen jumping up and falling back down in different organized energy levels. Each line is a result of energy being released from jumping down a different energy level. So the bigger the jump, the more energy that's released. A very big jump would be a high energy, something like purple, and a small jump would be something with low energy, something like red. This jump that I've written over here, yeah, it'd be like a medium jump. Maybe that's like actually yellow in color. So let's redraw that as maybe a yellow photon. If I wanted to do a smaller jump, that would be like a red. Maybe the electron only jumped up down from there to there, and there would be a red bright line. And then a very large jump would result in very high energy, or like a purple color. So maybe the electron jumped all the way up and down, and then fell all the way back down here, and that would be a purple photon. And that's where these different bright line spectrum colors come from. Schrodinger expanded upon that idea even further. So he came up with the Schrodinger wave equation. You can Google it if you'd like. It's quite complex. We're not going to use it. But he said that the electron is even weirder than what we think. It doesn't even reside on these energy levels. The electron exists as a particle and a wave of probability, which is very weird. All right. So sometimes it acts like a particle and sometimes it acts like a wave of energy. It's very complex. We'll get to that a little bit later. So his wave equation described mathematically the wave properties of electrons and other small particles. He said that these things are very weird. They don't just travel in little orbits like this, but they actually travel in orbitals, a 3D region of space about the nucleus that indicates the possible location for electron. It doesn't even have to stay there. It's just a possible location. And these wave equations that he came up with is really what governs our understanding of the atom. So the electrons aren't just hanging out in neat little orbits like Bohr thought. They're actually in these orbitals like Schrodinger thought. And this is what we've been able to detect so far. This is kind of what some of those 3D regions of space or orbitals look like. Here we have an S orbital. These are P orbitals. This is a D orbital. And this is an F orbital. Notice how that's getting more and more complex. This is going to make a lot more sense when we talk about electron configuration. But for now, this is our understanding of what the atom looks like. Now you might say, well, how do I draw a picture of that? Well, the picture is a little bit confusing. You might see something, you know, like this. And that's like drawn an atom with a like, you know, positive center in the middle. Or you might see all these different overlapping orbitals on top in which you'd have like an S orbital and then D orbitals. And then, oh, well, that'd be a D orbital. This would be maybe a P orbital. And then we have F orbitals. So all these things kind of stack on top of each other like Russian nesting dolls. 
It's very peculiar and weird, but that's our current understanding of what this thing actually looks like. So for now, we're going to end, and hopefully you understand a little bit more about the atom.